went away, but I can. Yeah. Zoom is messing they, with the interface. They've also added a stack of apps. Yes, which are showing up on the right in a pesky way because yeah. I really don't want them there. <laughs> yeah, and some of them look possibly interesting, but who knows? Can we get rid of them? No, there's no way to get rid of them. Oh, closed uh, dock, lower right, three dots, lower right, closed dock. Maybe that'll do it. I think that's, is that, oh, is that, that this dock? Or is that, the, or is that the bottom dock? No, that is the dock. Good, thank you. Gone. Did that do it? Ha. That did it. Okay, good. Excellent. But you can't reopen it. <laughs> it's gone forever. Uh, oh, well. Impossible. I don't think I did, Bill. No, he's asking me. No, no, Bill, I did not. At least not this morning. Maybe. Sorry, sometime. it's just a bad. Sorry, you know. I may. Inveterate, I may, inveterate old guy. You said possibly. No, I'm I like, may. Possibly would be better. <laughs> I, I, a, I may have said that at some point in my life. I may. It have was said a possibly. punny humor thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, like a lead. You know. We will not infect you. Pete's got house guests at home. I know. Yeah. Um. Cool. So Doug hasn't shown up yet. I wanted to wait till Doug showed up to sort of inquire within whether uh, I've got the right process. Mm -hmm. um, but if not, I think we'll just start rolling with that process if that's okay with people. My goal, my, my intention was to experiment with uh, something more, something closer to Doug Carmichael's conscious conversations process mm -hmm. for the call, uh, mm -hmm. which means to me, to treat it a little bit more like a uh, Quaker meeting than like, uh, you know, uh, OGM check-in. Uh, and Kevin had replied on the OGM list that the chat is really useful. And if you know me, you know I adore chat. And I think chat is super useful. But this is an exercise in attention management and giving our, the gift of our full attention um, to whoever is checking in and the chat is distracting in that sense. So I think I'm going to ask uh, that everybody keep their own notes in a separate little notes document, whatever thing you want for when we're done with the round of check-ins. Just make little notes, whatever, anything you want to put in the conversation. And then when we've, when we've done a round of checking in, we will then see what's up and uh, share those notes, whatever, whatever bubbles to the top at that point. Gil, did you want to say something before we start? Yeah, just a brief observation. Last week, when you handed the con over to Ken, um, he did a tiny thing that may have gone unnoticed, which is that he just took a few beats between when somebody finished speaking and when he called on the next person. And it, for me, it had an enormous impact in quieting and deepening the conversation. Thank so you. I, that's very much in the spirit of what you're saying, but I just wanted to flag that for you. Very much. I love that. Yeah. Um, and I'm sort of watching who's coming into the room. I've been keeping the list sequentially, uh, just in order of arrival, which I think is a reasonable way to start a, a list of, of uh, order for check-ins. So we don't, the, the protocol of each person who volunteers to check in, picking the next check-in person gets confusing and adds mental burden. So let's, let's not do that. Uh, we tried long ago maintaining a list on a Google Doc or elsewhere for who wanted to check in. That that's clumsy too. So let's just go with this for for now, uh, and see where it takes us. I'm noticing that I'm not on the list, so I should probably add myself. <clears throat> um, and um, there's Doug. One of the Dougs. The other Doug. The other Doug. <laughs> Hi, Doug. Um, I'm hoping that Doug Carmichael joins us right now so we can go in because I'm honoring his rec his uh, request to to do the check-ins a different way. Um, okay, so so uh, we'll start the check-ins now. I'm going to post uh, whenever somebody else ju uh, jumps into the room, I will update the list. That's all I'll do. I'm going to ask that we not use the chat today. Um, until we've done all of our check-ins and then it's free for all time in the chat. Uh, I'm going to ask that each of us keep notes if you want to in some other app where you can copy paste or do whatever, but, uh, but let's keep the chat still so that it's not distracting. Um, I'm going to close my chat except for when I'm updating the list of, of, you know, who's in the, in the queue kind of thing. 
Um, and then I don't think I'll step in between. I think maybe we'll do what Gil just suggested and we'll, we know exactly who's next in the check-ins, but if you'll take a, a moment, pause a moment um, at the end of whoever was before you before jumping in, that'll help. And it'll help us um, sort things out and uh, mind the space. With that, uh, the updated list and uh, Stacy, you've got the con. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that last part about pausing a minute, because when Gil said what he did, I was thinking it's also like a two-way kind of street, like we can help by just taking a minute ourselves, mm -hmm. although sometimes it's hard. I know for many of us, we feel like somebody else will jump in before we get that opportunity. Um, so what's really on my mind right now is as we're watching like the circus unfold in Congress, is that I'm really disappointed because as I had just mentioned last week, I thought that this was finally an opportunity as we were going through the tax returns that people were finally gonna learn something about the tax system, not necessarily about Trump. And as we're watching this media circus, I'm thinking about the stories that aren't being covered. And one that's really on my mind is the attorney general in the Virgin Islands who is linking Chase Bank to Jeffrey Epstein's business dealings. And it is not being covered at all. And I'm just, I'm, I'm frustrated because even the new media outlets that I was very optimistic about, like the Midas Touch and things like that, they're all doing the same thing. All I've heard about is Kevin McCarthy. And the truth is, the way I'm thinking it, Trump is the one that's gaining from this because we're not talking about any criminal charges that are coming up, anything in his taxes, any ties with you know the story I just mentioned. So I just wanted to say that we're kind of all to blame because we're all, I mean, that's all I've been seeing on Facebook and social media. And I just wanted to get that off my chest because it's it's frustrating. <laughs> And Mr. Heaven Strike, uh, if you're following the, the cues I gave at the start, uh, you're next. And uh, I thought you were just waiting a beat, but I didn't. I, I then became unsure if you were waiting a beat. So, okay. So, how long a beat is? <laughs> so, uh, well. And if I interrupt, and if I and if I interrupted the beat you were giving us, tell me right now, and I'll I'll not jump back in like that. Okay. Yeah. And so, just happy New Year, everyone. Uh, yeah. I'd, I'll um, refrain from the political side of stuff, being a federal employee, employee, but uh, yeah, it is, <laughs> it is just, it is insane what's going on. Um, I guess, well, I've just been taking a lot of, um, kind of, the, well, took a step back with everything. I mean, I'm uh, with, from the doctoral program, just trying to really focus on, on what, on priorities or like think I've got ideas about how to identify you know, what is the most strategic thing to be working on. And I found a book, um, Life's a Great Question. I think I had mentioned it before. I guess. <laughs> yeah, I'd, uh, next week, if things were were better, I'd be out in, out in Santa Barbara with uh, my doctoral program. So this is the pool at the Hilton in Santa Barbara. It's my one of my backgrounds. I'll go back to uh, turn it out. Let's see. Yeah, so there's this book, um, Life's Great Question, um, that Tom Rath, the Strengths Finder, uh, and um, actually has a companion website, Contribuify. So I'm going to oh. be working through that to, um, to um, we'll see what insights come from that. And um, been doing a lot of work with the IFSS, so there's a, um, a lot of good things there. And then, so um, I guess I'll just leave it at that now for check in. I don't want to take too long.
Good morning, everybody. Yeah. Um, so many things to think about and check about. Um, uh, so I've 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 entered the year in what for me is a very surprisingly calm and focused state. I actually did a, a a year planning process that I've had in my files for a long time, but actually took it out and looked at it this time and thought about and kind of the five major domains of activity that I'm looking at in both business and personal, my goals for each of them. Actually, I, I, I came across somebody who said, don't set goals, think about themes. What are your themes for the year? The goals will happen within that. So it's a much softer way into that story. Uh, and so I've uh, framed out a few goals for the year and thought about what that means for the first quarter and what those mean for the first month. And then just put that aside and found that my day-to-day -day is calmer, clearer, more focused in that context. Um, so that's one story. Um, the political circus is fascinating. Um, I posted a tweet yesterday observing that, uh, that the shit show in Congress right now is not really any different from the general shit show, which is a tiny band. Uh, of uh, uh, of people holding hostage a larger band of people, which is what the Freedom Caucus is doing with the Republican with with Kevin McCarthy, but what the Republicans are doing for the country. So there's that. I was stunned that um, I think that got more views than any tweet I've ever done. My tweets tend to run a hundred or two hundred views for some reason, and this was four thousand when I went to bed last night. So that was kind of intriguing. Um, um, I'm more or less mirroring Twitter to Mastodon, but it doesn't seem to always work, or maybe it works with very long delays, but um, <clears throat> there's that world. I'll let other people talk about that. And I am um, finally taking us, since, since Carl set the pattern of show and tell, I'm finally doing a serious dive into, no, doesn't focus, into the tree of knowledge. The biological instructions to blur everything. So you have, put it right in front of your face and it might, Focus. I should not just turn off my blur. Oh, anyway, let's try this. Try this video back on. Come on. There you go. Yes. Uh -huh. The Tree of Knowledge, the Biological Roots of Human Understanding by Maturana and Varela, rich, deep, profound. Uh, I've hopped around in it for years, and I'm actually just going through it carefully and thoroughly now. I've been very provoked and enriched by it. So for folks who are interested in things like human consciousness, hop in. Um, I'll leave it there for now. Um, I wish I had something great to report. Anyway, um, I, I want to echo what uh, Stacy said. I'm just really, I guess my feeling, I did some reflections at the end of the year. My feeling right now is that I'm quite, I guess, I don't know what the word would be. I'm quite disappointed in basically our own power acting, just the society we're in and how we're socio politically and economically thinking about things i feel i'm stuck in my own first order learnings of how the world works when i was a little kid so i'd like to get out of that it's not as easy as it seems um so i guess my one project for this year i think will be to learn how to manage my sadness right now so mm. I, I'll let you know. I don't know how it's going, but anyway, I'm kind of. Um, Ken Homer pointed to something, a book about, uh, which I have on loan. I don't really remember much about the book. I got it on loan at the library. It's, it's a novel about a woman who is kind of ecological, but she has this really love-hate relationship with a forest. But in the end, there's a little reflection where she comes to terms with what's going on in the forest. And there's a line I just remember, but it was like, 
she learns that in the wintertime, ants just sort of all nestle together in a big little ball and kind of hibernate. And the line from that book is that she says, she writes, I wish humans had as much confidence in each other. And I guess that's really is sitting with me right now. So I would look forward to being as confident as we can with mm -hmm. each other. So happy new year. Yeah. I'm actually on fire, you know, the uh, the energy that is building up <clears throat> in in the markets uh, in 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 a, in a general sense is incredible. <clears throat> and I think the political fights that you see um, uh, right now are, are a reflection of that. <clears throat> I mean, McCarthy would be a disaster as a House Speaker. And the entire configuration of having these lunatics line up to um, lead house committees on agriculture, on energy, on environmental issues, and so on, is just unfathomable. It just can't happen. So <clears throat> now the people who are actually sabotaging McCarthy to get elected are the least likely you would have expected to do this. Uh, it just makes no sense. I was listening <clears throat> to an interview yesterday and the reasoning they have behind them is is just pure ban and speak now it just makes no sense um but it it has uh, I, I think it's it's a good thing you know this needs to sort itself out in ways that uh, uh allow a functioning government to continue because these 20 folks who are preventing McCarthy to get into office um, would be chaos <clears throat> if, if allowed anywhere near a position of power. If you have listened to some of these hearings that they're conducting, it's just incredible. I think from, from my perspective, there is a film out that I'm sorry, but I know we're not, I, I can't hold up the book, but I, I'm going to put in the link, which I watched yesterday. Um, which is with Jeff Bridges, who, who is really good, but it's living in the future's past. If you haven't seen this, it's a must watch film. Because what it what, what they're basically saying is we live in an illusion. Yeah. Um, the the levels of consumption that we currently have um, is completely unsustainable. Uh, we are literally fraying the natural world around us. It's really crumpling you now because we continue to extract uh, so much resources out of uh, out of the uh, on a global level, um, while we are you know, ignoring that we are consuming 1.8 times the regenerative capacity of the planet. 90% of fish stocks are overfished. 30% you know, of the topsoil is lost already. Aquifers are being dried out uh, around the world. You now rivers polluted and so on. It's a it's a madness what we what we uh, see. The escalation is just uh, uh, over the last year since I've been watching, you know, uh, uh, looking at this closer. Which since my retirement ten years ago, um, it has it has um, accelerated. You know the the consumption and push levels. But on the other hand, you see uh, more and more people truly alarmed and, and uh, understanding the need to change. And um, what hasn't sunk in yet and, and what this year will need to accomplish is to, to help people really see um, that this is really an existential uh, crisis. This is this could really destroy our civilization. In fact, it will. You know, um, it's far more likely to not work long term than it is to somehow we'll make it through it. We're not. You know, the uh, environmental devastation we have we have created uh, is so significant, <clears throat> but yet it's still it's still kept. Uh, 
at bay. You know, we are busy, we are preoccupied, and so on. Um, so that's that also led me to how can you supercharge this thing, right? So I looked at the artificial intelligence discussions and and looked at some of the software and what have you, but that really that really wouldn't uh, I, I I don't see that as a as a useful tool at this point. But what I do think uh, is is uh, going to help is augmented intelligence, and in some ways we're all doing this already. So when you when you take an article or when you have a specific focal focus point um, and the algorithms that that we are all working with because of the searches that we are conducting and the relationships we have been stitching together, you know you you come across an article that says exactly what you uh, uh, were looking for with with data embedded and all of this. So you use this. You modify it, and uh, uh, and then you look incredibly smart because you came up with such deep-seated knowledge in a topic. Um, and in some ways, that's the same as asking an artificial intelligence bot to write something, but it's far more aimed and directed. It's actually of much higher value than than uh, it would be otherwise. So, um, I really, I really think. Um, and Gene Ballinger, you know, is the world champion in building tools and Jerry's brain, right? We're all building tools, you know, to try to keep this information together because it's beyond what we can track um, and then find it again when you uh, need to make a specific argument because you cannot load into your brain the depth of uh, information that is required to really make a point, right? So, so I'm a yeah I'm a uh, I hate learning new software I'm so sick of it but uh, um, I think the 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 challenge really is to to think of ourselves as the supercomputer you know you think of yourself as the central processor um, that needs to have information fed through and and, and sorted and made made uh, 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 into connections and then look at all the data banks around you as servers you know and and then uh, um, you can advance your your theories so yeah so i'm excited i mean i've got my my first webinar going the focus my focus is completely to make markets work meaning that the the reality that the food system the farmer has to change means that the entire food system will have to adapt itself and it's as profound in in the food and agriculture world as it is in the energy sector you know um we 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 like to continue on bouncing around on the surface um to keep uh, the existing ways to live uh going i mean we call it bow you know and 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 to use technology and tinker on the edges to put it together but uh, uh what is in front of us are deep behavioral changes and adaptations that we'll have to uh, we'll have to make there's no way around it I see that Pete had passed. That is correct. Ah, okay. Um, I apologize. I got a bit of a late start this morning, so I'm out with the uh, out still walking the dog. So just a couple of 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 uh, quick quick thoughts. Um, one is, you know, substantively, not surprisingly, it has to do with with climate change. I'm reading all the different stories. You know. Uh, the year in review for 2022 and how 2023 is going to be a great year and it's going to be the year that we finally make all this progress on climate technologies and climate markets and 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 climate everything else um and and of course we won't right i mean we we do this every year it's 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 the ultimate hamster wheel um and and so we just just 
do the same thing over and over and over again. It's just, it's just mind boggling to me. Um, and, and so that's, you know, that's very frustrating uh, just because it, it, how do you solve the big problems that, that Klaus and others have sort of passing off a dog here to a wife? Um, how do you solve the other big problems that we're supposed to try and uh, solve when, you know, all we, when we can't get, even get off the hamster wheel, you know, not to mention the politics, the polarization, all the different things. I mean, I just, I just can't figure out how one, how one really makes progress on this. Um, on a personal note, I guess, you know, maybe it's linked to this, maybe it's not. My New Year's resolution for the year I'm realizing is that at the end of this year, I want my household to sort of be ready to transition in case something were to happen and I were to drop dead, my wife were to drop dead. Um, I don't want my kids to have to go through what I went through when my mother died a couple of years ago. Um, you know, it was just chaos. And, uh, and we've got a much bigger house than she did. So I don't want my wife to be grappling for six months with the aftermath of my keeling over. And so by the end of this year, I really want you know, 80 to 85% of the work to be done for an orderly transition, should that become necessary. And, uh, and so that, that's sort of my main uh, New Year's resolution as, as macabre as that, might, uh, as that might sound. Thank you. Mark, for sharing. Thanks for everyone else for sharing. There's um, uh, noticing a lot of different thoughts and um, my own response to what's been shared today. And it's uh, it's moving. And um, I'll try my best to to kind of um, bring it all together in a way that's succinct. I, for myself, I think this year I am personally stepping up into roles that have um, a little more responsibility for myself. So I'm, you know, starting my own uh, small business. I hope to be in space with others and leading um, kind of educational or community circles similar to this um, with maybe a different lens. And I think what is becoming clear to me, or at least it just feels a little more pressing, is the sense of responsibility I have to manage my own, learn how to manage my own, uh, I don't, I, this is, I'm afraid this is going to sound itchy, but like um, heart openness as I, as I navigate being in community with others, as I navigate being in a space of holding space for others um, and, and all of the things that I feel can challenge or compromise that, right? And so even what we've been sharing so far um, in this circle around what's going on in the news, what's going on in our politics. I'm, I'm in curiosity around how to be in relationship with what is happening, not just in politics, but, you know, all the change that we're collectively managing together um, in a way that isn't bypassing it. I'm, I'm, and I'm still able to be present with the gravity of the situations but also in a way that doesn't disempower me and, and close and, and lead to my closing, if that makes sense. And how do I take care of my nervous system? How do I take care of my physiology? How do I be mindful of being not being pulled into what, you know, I guess my, my lens around um, using the, the political uh, scene as, a, as an example here, um, this kind of innately disempowering structure, right? I, and this is my lens in my opinion, but I do feel that when I engage with media, I, I am aware of how easily I tend to feel activated, how how hard it is for me to maintain that feeling of openness and neutrality, which I am, yeah, really starting to, I think, recognize can dictate how effective I am in a given day, how uh, um, effectively I'm able to connect with others. And so just learning how to take care of that, I, I, those are all some questions I'm holding for myself and curiosities. Um, I think that's, that's something that's really present for me right now. And I feel completely with that.
Thanks, Patty. I think um, I think you put lovely words to things that a lot of us are working with and struggling with. Uh, I know in particular for me, that boundary between self-maintenance and engagement with the world. And uh, it's come up several times from other people's check-ins, but we're in a whirlwind that could end very badly. How do we participate? How do we, where do we apply our energy? How do we keep our heart and soul open? <clears throat> and yet, um, there's definitely this feeling that if you get too engaged and too connected, you could just rip things apart, like inside of yourself. And that's, I don't know how else, how, how to describe it, but I think there's a, there's a feeling we're all skirting a dangerous spot. Um, uh, a thing that I helped April put into some of her speeches is about the future and, and like your orientation to the future. Do you see the future uh, ahead of you? Is it a hole you might fall into? Is it a thing up in the sky you aspire to climb to? Is it a thing coming at you from the left that you're trying to avoid or dodge? <clears throat> so, so even just sort of spatially, like where is the future relative to you is, is an interesting little exercise. <clears throat> because uh, that that's part of a, a conversation she does about the difference between hope and fear. And fear is the hole in front of you you might fall into. Hope is the aspiration, the thing to look up to. Um, uh, I watched last night before going to sleep uh, Zelensky's year, uh, New Year's speech because I subscribed to Jim Fallows, the Atlantic guy. I put this on Town Square uh, in the Mattermost, so some of you might have seen it there. Some of you might subscribe to Jim Fallows, who is brilliant and wonderful. But this is a 17-minute speech that ends exactly at midnight uh, this last New Year's. And I, I don't watch it unless you're prepared to cry for a while because uh, it's beautiful. It's it's what what Fallows did was he used to be a speechwriter for Carter and he drew attention to it, saying, "This is like poetry. This is this is this is magic. It's it's really good, and it is really good. It's uh, it's just a phenomenal talk. So, however it came about, uh, congratulations to them. But it's really worth watching. Um, I. Flipped my toenail on Monday, which is irritating, but not uh, debilitating, uh, but reminds me of my fallibilities and and uh, now and then. So trying to figure out uh, where that goes. And then more than anything, I think my check-in is um, as the new year starts, I'm, I'm putting myself in a mental mode of, uh, this is going to sound macabre or morbid as well, uh, maybe, maybe sort of going on Mark's thread, but in a different way because uh, we don't have kids. So, uh, you know, what, what stays behind for family doesn't matter as much as it does for people with kids. Uh, but I'm pretending, what if I had a terminal illness and I knew I was going to die in a year? What would I want to do with my life energy this year? <laughs> and I'm aiming for bigger goals. I'm aiming for uh, a, a place to do uh, more here with us. Uh and also kind of in general with my life energy in different ways, because I'm um, I'm reasonably competent at hosting a series of salons that are relaxed and relatively safe, not always for everyone. Um, but um, but that doesn't always uh, get us any place. And we've been critiqued, I think, well by by people who've come through the space about uh, what to do, what not doing, et cetera. And I wanted to like, just go figure out from my perspective, what does, what does it mean to pour energy into uh, this space for me? And how does that mesh with what other people care about and what's going on? So I created a page on the Relate Wiki, which is like, hey, what are my bigger goals? Uh, I won't screen share now or explain them, but I'm happy to talk about them with anybody or, you know, talk them through. If you're really interested, ping me and we can do a separate Zoom call. Uh, the 1 through 12 list of things, think of them as months of the year, but also the project ideas there um, are bigger than one month worth of, worth of work. One of them is write a, a Neo book, which is like write a book except a modular book that sort of gets assembled from nuggets that exist out on massive wiki style markdown documents that roll up into and then get produced out as and in a snapshot version as an epub for kindle uh, reading for example that's just one of them and that's clearly more than one can do in one month so this is a a longer list of things <clears throat> but this is my list and part of the problem is that a couple of these 
there's only a couple people interested in, uh, maybe like me and a few others, uh, like the pattern language thing. I think there's a few huge pattern language fans and otherwise there's, there's not a great demand in the world for elevated and uh, improved and more accessible pattern languages. But I think that there's like a, a need for that. So trying to figure all that out. Um, but I'm trying to figure out how to shift my days and my habits and my attention and my focus to do this instead of what I've been doing recently without losing too much of what I normally do reasonably well. Um, uh, with that, I'm complete. Uh, John, we're doing a different method today. I'll paste instructions in the chat in a moment. We're not using the chat very much. And uh, you haven't seen who the list is, but uh, uh, hang on a second and I'll put instructions in the chat. With that, I'm complete. So at the risk of being perceived as a Pollyanna, um, I'm sort of oriented around the present. Um, not spending a whole lot of time looking back and uh, not doing any projecting into the future. And um finding myself um energized and and getting sharper and crisper and clearer about um upping the upping both the the ante and the focus and the intention behind what i am bringing to the world how I'm doing me, how I can do me better, uh, how I can be um, more focused, intentional, and respectful of my time and attention in service to what I want to bring to the world, um, which is more of a lived being thing than it is a, a noun thing, um, a producing of nouns or objects or offerings thing. It's more of a modeling, living, and projecting and energizing center focus. So, um, and I'm getting more and more aware and excited at um, the power of any one particular person, like rocking the boat and changing the world. And um, the number of people that are emerging and are affecting and influencing um, growing to, the, to the, the light wolf side of the ledger. Um, and I'm just experiencing and seeing more of those voices, of those messages of um, reason and, um, and insight and intelligence and perspective and all of that um, finding its way. And, and literally that in the frame of, you know, does it hit my eyeballs and ears in the course of a day organically? as a phenomenon, <laughs> um, not going deeper than, um, is it 90% dystopic um, stuff or is it, you know, starting to balance out and starting to diversify more? And, and my sense and feeling is um, there's really, really massive shifting going on 
and um, there is new stuff birthing. And it may not get the, the top three news networks attention, you know, it may not be um, from a media, through a media lens, the uh, evident, but just on an energetic projecting out, manifesting in the world level, um, it's there and it's growing. And, um, and I, I attach a optimism to the unprecedented reality of what technology and media and connection and communication means uh, that exist today that have, are unprecedented uh, for global reach, global activation, global reactivity as an organism, um, that uh, everything is visible in a way that it's never been visible in real time before. And, um, and I, I um, Bill, I, I hear you loud and clear about, you know, are we capable <laughs> of doing better um, as a species or not? You know, have we evolved enough to, to turn the ship? Um, I sort of intrinsically believe we are. Well, the potential, the intrinsic capacity is there. Whether we'll use it or not in time, I don't know. But but that like the capacity is there, and uh, and I do believe in us. Um, not that I can give you anything objective to hang my hat on for why I believe that, but I do believe in us, and. Uh, so with that, I'm complete. Thank you, Doug. Um, good morning. This is a season of cold and darkness. And um, mm, simply getting out of bed putting like pants on, um, starting the day, um, going to work at the Internet Archive, um, fixing this bug, fixing that bug, thinking about the lifelong writing down of thoughts and the exploration into what is a thought what is a thought as an organism what is a thought as a sign in semiotics what is a thought as information um continues to occupy um not enough of my time i want to really focus on the sense that people can create a self-created system of their own truth in a software system that they can interact with, that they can basically have sacredly private for themselves and kind of see in a very simple way how they themselves hear other people, how they hear themselves a listening tool for the self. I don't have the desire to be marketing or to be 
promoting or or um, being some kind of evangelist. It's simply the ability for people to take time, reflect quietly about who they are, who their own mind is in relation to who they are, who their body is in relation to who their friends and family and the information that comes from outside of themselves, how they see that as true or untrue. If I know anything, it's that feelings are real. And I want to focus on feeling. And that's a that's a really different frame of being than the technological artificial intelligence, you know, chat GPT kind of um thing. I had a friend uh text me and have I put my um two and a half million thoughts and chat GPT and see how it comes out. That's not that's not of any any interest whatsoever. It's the way that language allows us to be together. Me communicating to you, you communicating me, me listening to you, all of you. Um that is so incredibly important for us to be able to express and share our humanity and build together. Um, it's a sense more of poetry or literature than of advertising or design or um, some kind of uh, persuasion. Um, I think that everybody has this incredible almost impossibly beautiful self within themselves. And sometimes through trauma or um, disease or, or just bad, damn bad luck or terrible decisions, we get in bad places. And you know, my focus is on healing. Um, quiet, cold, appropriate to the season, slow down, just be here. Thanks. So can you hear me okay? Thank you. Um, yeah, I, uh, I, was, I came in late, unfortunately, the doctor's office with my wife, so I stepped on sound. And uh, I appreciate what Mark was speaking to, um, and resonated on several levels, what Mark was talking about. Well, actually, it's the two marks, uh, so I should say, both of them. <laughs> so, uh, can you hear me okay? All right, okay. So, um, I'll be brief. Uh, my, my word of the year um, is uh, equity moonshot. Uh, some of you may already know this, but uh, in another group, I said, that's going to be my word until the day I die. And... Uh, somebody uh, said, well, hopefully the, the word will live beyond your death. Actually, that's part of my uh, sort of my small effort at a legacy. Um, so um, I'm, I'm in the process of uh, designing a learning uh, experience and process of, of uh, 
how to address some of the issues that the first mark spoke about. You know, we just we just we we just don't we're not moving the needle. And I think we have to step back and think about it. So I've been thinking about this for a couple of years, and uh, I'm working on a similar process or for the equity news learning academy. And equity news is a specific type of change agent. Rick, your audio is, is actually getting worse. Um, I don't know that your headset is actually giving us proper audio. You were fine okay. earlier, but is now it's harder. Want yes, that? much better. That okay. is better. Right. Sorry to interrupt right. you. So, oh, no, thank you for giving me the feedback. I'm sorry about that. Uh, so anyway, I can use this as sort of a Socratic ship or an east-west, um, uh, not a facilitator. Uh, it's more of a guide uh, for change and how can we cultivate that uh, and create a movement around how people can ask big, very audacious questions. So that's what I'm working on. I'm developing like a five-day challenge in the three-month course. But the most important outcome of that is creating a learning community around how to create generative dialogues to become more effective in solving a complex web of wicked problems that we're, we all know about and we're not doing, we're not very successful at. So um, that's what I'm interested in, and I'm quite happy to, to connect with anyone. Uh, if you can, with, with me via LinkedIn, uh, that's where I'm trying to do uh, some work and collaborate with people. Um, so that's it in a nutshell. So I'm Rick, and I'm done speaking. Thank you very much for the opportunity for um, saying what mis good mischief I'd like to get up to until I die. Over and out. Hello, everybody. Good to be here. Happy New Year. And uh, the last two weeks of the year, um, I spent having fun. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, it was in a Yiddish New York event, and I was learning beginner's Yiddish and uh, some music, uh, the modes that are used in klezmer music. So then I have to stuff that all back into a box now because I'm back at work. <laughs> So is that the way life is meant to be lived? <laughs> Question <laughs> that I got to just take out little pieces of it here and there, just keep myself uh, motivated. So a uh, good thing is um, I'm going to be participating in a Purim play for my synagogue this year. That'll be fun. I'll be a train conductor. <laughs> it's, they're doing the Music Man a parody of that for the Purim characters. So that'll be cool. So let's see, um, something my yoga teacher said that the outcome of this year will depend a lot on how we individually approach it or what we give to the year, <laughs> which makes a lot of sense. Uh, it's the motivation is a tricky thing these days, how to stay motivated with everything going on and working in different work environments and everything. Um, but I've actually been using Mark Carranza's MX system for my personal use and a little bit for work because like it tracks the time that I type something so I could see when I start something, when I end something. I, it can become a time tracking tool if people want that, but uh, I'm just having fun with it. Uh, just dreaming about ideas of how it can link to media, like photos that I have, uh, where I could have some metadata about photos. But is that reinventing the wheel, like rebuilding Apple's photo system? Or maybe it's a better photos organization system for me. Because like I could take photos of notebooks, my, see my pages, and then maybe I could transclude them over time uh, into other documents. But I mean, everybody's building their own version of that somehow. And somehow I'm just avoiding other tools. And I'm actually going back to index cards and manila folders for certain things. And he brought up the topic of feelings. And I'll mention that I have difficulty identifying my feelings. Um, and my therapists have known noticed that too. It's a tough thing for certain people. And just some interests. Um, 
so a related interest is linguistics now, the structure of language. And that's coming from an interesting path because uh, I'm working on an exhibit for the v Vintage Computer Federation when they have their event in April. And the topic is computers and education. So I'll demonstrate some old computers running some music education software. But as part of that, my mind goes on a parallel track into research because um, there was the Plato system years ago where universities paid a lot of money to get these nice orange terminals with lessons that the instructors developed. And there was actually a music system developed for it called Guido. And uh, so I'm trying to find more information about Guido because actually work I did for the University of Delaware was an extension of what they used to have. Like they tried to re-implement it in uh, what was uh, at that time Java applets. And that's the part that I did. And that lasted for 10 years until Java security issues killed that project. <laughs> okay, so that's where I am. We can have some hope for a new year. Thanks. Thanks, Eric. Uh, sure. You are the last in the queue because John just commented in the chat that he had to drop off for some caregiving responsibilities and made the very astute observation that we're not actually doing serious conversation because as we got into this, I went and checked my notes and I missed uh, at least one important marker of the serious conversations process, which is that uh, there's this, I called it conscious conversations, but it was serious conversations. And the question that Doug would put in front of the group is this one, what's on your mind that's worthy of serious conversation, which I did not do to cue us into this one. So maybe we run this experiment again and do that. I think we sort of did part of the format with the check-in as our individual goals. Um, and I think that's, you know, different in nature for what results we would get from the conversation. But let's take a moment and just reflect on uh, on the process and then go into whatever, wherever it takes us. Gil, go ahead. Take a moment first. First of all, just um, really thank you to everybody. I very much appreciate the quality the mood, the rhythm, um, the quality of what people spoke. Uh, Jerry, even without that opening prompt, it was sort of there implicitly um, and might have been there a little bit more if it had been spoken. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, I just really, I'm really struck at how unfamiliar in a, in a very familiar way this conversation has felt. This is how, this is how humans used to speak to each other once. It's not how we do it these days very much, and certainly not on this medium. Uh, and it just feels very grounding and enriching. And I'm, 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 I'm moved by this, and I can feel feel the moisture uh, in my face. Um, so thank you for that. If I remember correctly, one of the other things Doug said is at the end of all the go-round, people could talk about, well, which of those themes do you want to pursue? And it sounds like we're not going to do that just yet. Um, but if I could just um, react to a couple of things. Um, 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 when Klaus spoke earlier on about the um, the rapid destruction of the living world, um, You know, this is something that I've known about for decades and my work has been involved in for decades, but at a fairly heady level. And lately it's coming back and hitting me in my body uh, more and more. Um, Klaus, your reminder of that, um, 60 Minutes of All Things had a piece Sunday night about this. Uh, the news pickup was about how Paul Ehrlich has always been wrong about his population projections, but what Ehrlich is, was actually talking about was the destruction of the living world. And the numbers, Klaus, are striking, um, but it hit me very hard last night 
in one of the moments of Zen that YouTube TV throws up of pictures of natural world, quiet, you know, just like watching stuff. And it was, it was a field full, full of fireflies, full of fireflies. And I realized that my nephew, Ev, who's four years old, five years old next month, will never see that. And so it took the, the big story and the quantitative story and the documented story into a place of just, you know, personal presence and anguish at the loss of what it's like for people to grow up in a world where they have no contact with that aspect of life. Um, and so maybe that's part of the story about how we engage this and shift this and, you know, open up a different future. Um, I'll just say one other thing I have. I, I, I like the process of keeping quiet notes outside the chat. That was good. Um, when Mark spoke, I was um, reminded of the quote that's often attributed to Winston Churchill. It actually goes to, goes to Abba Iban, the Israeli diplomat, who said that nations do behave wisely once they have exhausted all other alternatives. And, uh, you know, Will we exhaust the other alternatives in time? Don't know. Anyhow, thank you all for this. Thanks, Gil. Stacy. Uh, thank you, Gil. I, I wanted to echo the first part of what Gil said. And I wanted to say, Jerry, I'm glad you left out the last prompt about what's worthy of a serious conversation because part of what I really liked about this is everybody gave something of themselves and who's to judge what's worthy of a serious conversation. If somebody's coming here with something they need to express, they shouldn't have to think, well, is it worthy? So I wanted to say, I appreciated that because I don't know that I would have shared what I did if that worthiness, if I had to go through that evaluation process. Thank you. Thanks, Stacey. Um, and what's worthy of serious conversation really ups the ante in a, in a, a very interesting way and creates a different conversation. And uh, I think that th that that is just uh, worth. Thanks, Patty. Oh, Mr. Um, uh, Stuart and Michael, we did our check ins in a different way, which was not exactly Doug Carmichael's serious conversations, but sort of toward it. So we're debriefing a little bit and then going into a more normal uh, round. And if you guys want to check in uh, after we've debriefed, that'd be that'd be great, too. Um, Klaus. Yeah, just to follow up for a moment, this uh, film that I posted there, Living in the Future's Past, uh, is really well done because it goes into the emotional, it looks at us from an evolutionary perspective as a species, you know, what are the traits that we have as a species that made us so successful and how these traits are now at a, uh, uh, at a point where you need to flip them because we, the, the, the success has been so traumatic that we are now causing our own demise basically by continuing as we have and it explains the the only way we can really process this is in the heart you know in the in the uh, in the emotional component part of it but there is a sense of helplessness that comes with this because none of us individually can do much about it now so so how do you how do you engage in ways where you feel you have a participation and a role in in uh, in adapting and mitigating you know, our future? But uh, um, it, it's really a personal journey, and I've long thought that the only way this can really happen is at the scale of a reformation, because a reformation is a paradigm shift. Right, so the this requires uh, us to look at the world around us and the way we interact with the world around us in a fundamentally different way. 
uh, and collectively searching, but it also makes the point, you know, this movie, uh, and there are, there are behavioral psychologists, evolutionary psychologists uh, who are, who are uh, talking there. Um, we are basically um, more like a swarm as a species you know we, we have this idea of being uh, of having individual control or being independent and so on but in all reality our behavior is swarm like you know more like insects and <clears throat> and and uh, like more like a bee or an ant hive but so we have collective learning and and our behavior is within guardrails of cultural norms that force us into certain behavior. So the cultural norms are the first thing that would have to change to enable behavioral adaptations, to give permission, basically, to these adaptations. And that's an enormous challenge when you're living in a political system that, uh, <laughs> that has the old hierarchies, the old forms of decision-making, and, and uh, the... the uh, uh, rejection of science and and uh, the and accepting the reality as is realities uh, in order to uh, persevere, you know, in power structures. So it's going to be amazing. <laughs> I mean, because if we don't just succeed shifting, we're gonna not succeed. I mean, this will be in our lifetime, right? I mean, this is happening right now. Um, so yeah, yeah, it'll be it'll be a fun ride. Um, just a thought, Klaus, and I had this thought as we were going through the round of, of check-ins, uh, and I I sort of put it in symbolically in the chat as if you're not convinced humanity is in danger, click here, and it's it's a reaction I'm beginning to have, and I'm wondering if anybody else is having this reaction, and my reaction is. When I begin to listen to or read something from a person I really want to hear from, but the first long stretch is, we are very fucked. We are doomed. The earth is destroyed. And here's how. And this is failing. This is breaking. This is going bad. This is terrible. This is not working. These people are dysfunctional. This is awful. And there's this laundry list, this organ recital of, of, of what's breaking. I am, I am completely on board that we're steering the, 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 the bus into a cliff or off a cliff, completely on board. I just want to skip that part. So I want, to, I, want, I want somebody to write a book that says, hey, or create a website, which I might actually do, that says that starts with, if you're not convinced that humanity is in peril, click here. And over there is like all the evidence and everything about how things are really fucked up. I just want to get to what are the best ideas we have going about how to fix it? And I want to clear the decks. And I think this is why I had some, some trouble reading um, Doug's Garden World draft. Is like the first piece of it is like, we're fucked. I'm like, I'm in. I'm, con I'm, I'm, I'm on board. I'm convinced. I'm okay with I'm not okay with that. Uh, but, but I'm like, don't need to be, don't need to be shown or told uh, what's happening there. I, I, I just, before going to the people in the queue, raise your hand if, if you first, like, uh, jazz hands if this is how you feel as well. A few of us, um, many of us, I guess. Uh, Pete, is, Pete is so so. Um, and then I'll go to the go back to the queue. Um, Mark Carranza. Uh, thank you. Oops, lower hand. Um, one of the thoughts I had um, last night was are there any other species biological species that have this notion of race um and then what what is the origin of that how how does race in in the human species come up um how are there i know over evolutionary time you know these different um Um, yeah, separations within the same species. It's a you know scientific uh, kind of thing that I'm not quite qualified to study. I don't know how much further I'll um, pursue it, but you know it's one of the 
many thousands of things on that backlog of ah if i had enough in time to uh you know start a new um uh you know degree program to to kind of study um how race came up in evolution um because i don't we we have this world where we're shifting our ways of communicating with each other from uh person to person to where we are here um i'm looking at a reality one pixel deep where i see how many people 14 ish um um i might be a bot <laughs> <laughs> All right. um, but, uh, um, yeah it's um not sure if anybody has uh any pointers they can throw my way but i thought it was a fascinating question i've never heard dealt with in the scientific community but i know i know there's plenty of resources out there that have that have dealt with it i'm fully Fully trusting in that i think i've seen some things in the past but um i yeah it's we're a species that is quite different in many ways and we are changing um and we have that ability to kind of choose how we change um but to do that we have to convince other people in some way to to kind of come along with us um to you know, try new things, um, in, including, you know, this wacky thing for me, you know, the, the new pronouns and the, um, I uh, heard a little story about uh, a little girl who decided that um, she was a boy um, and, you know, wanted everybody to, you know, call her a boy. Yeah, it must have been like a seven-year-old and kind of going like, wow. Where, what do I do in that kind of situation? Um, hmm. Anyway, um, thanks for letting me speak that out. Um, thanks, Mark. And I, I was busy looking wildly through my brain for a book that immediately came to me, but not the title, not the author. And I finally found it. It's Isabel Wilkerson's cast, The Origin of Our Discontents, uh, which goes into this sum a lot. Uh, and caste is a formal way that colonialists basically discriminated uh, along race in cultures that they colonized, et cetera, et cetera. And the degree to which that became a huge thing is shocking and scary and saddening. Um, and I, Pete just found a, a different one. Uh, there's a lot of really interesting uh, work in this field. So um, thanks for asking the question. It's a it's a big civilizational level question. Really appreciate it. Uh, Doug B. Yeah, I just, um, the that idea of um, what, what I give attention to, what I voice, I feed. And so all the time and attention that's spent bemoaning what's wrong, what's broken, uh, is ultimately serving it, is ultimately feeding it. And Doug, Doug actually has said multiple times in this space that we, we have to do that and start there and I think that's, um, I'm not sure that I necessarily buy into that premise that that's required. It's in the rear view mirror and there's absolutely nothing we can do about what already has happened. Um, so I, you know, exponentially agree with focusing and devoting the, the time and the attention to the new to the way ways exploring the ways of doing us differently that doesn't produce um, what we're currently on the receiving end of. 
uh, Mark, on your thing about race, just to give it a, a, a twist, um, I, 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 a dear friend of mine is a guy named Bernie Krauss. He's a PhD in, in uh, bioacoustics. And, and in 68, he ran around the world recording in the most remote locations in the world um, and uh, coined the term soundscapes. And each location had a biome. The creatures that landed there landed there. Each one is unique and they land there because they found their frequency of voice and communication open, available to talk to each other without interference. And so you have these orchestral recording soundscapes. Um, and one of, one of his, his uh, uh, revenue centers was he would be hired by zoos and amusement parks that had live animal exhibitry and whatever um, to do sound treatments of the areas or the enclosures. And he was called in to an amusement park and they were having a real problem because there it was one of you know their zoo safari area. Um, they were having real problems with, the, with their gorillas. And the reason they were having problems with the gorillas is because their sound programming in that area was for mountain gorillas and the gorillas in the exhibit were savanna gorillas. Mm. And they were driving them insane. Mm. Wow. Wow. Now that's not racism, <laughs> but it's sort of the natural analog to me is just in the recognizing of differences of place and, and tribe and natural world meets the living creatures that are in it. And what on a frequency and energy level feels right, feels good is for me. And I remember in a past you know, traditional straight business world time in my life, I did 13 trips to Japan in a year. I was commuting every two weeks. And, but I remember the, the contrast, the cultural contract, contrast of the Japanese gestalt, the Japanese orientation experience of how to communicate and behave and move and, and what, was comfortable and familiar and safe, I think it ultimately maps to safety and earthing relative to the American style and how, what a, the learning curve I ended up in. Um, learning how to walk, talk and move, how to, how to interact and exist in a way that was, uh, not discordant, not triggering, not, you know, um, and just this sort of neutral, not political, but neutral idea of having awareness at that level, consciousness at that level, we lost as a species, like along the way, somehow, I, indigenous tribes know, know this stuff. Um, but we like got fractured and polarized and othered. And I'm not sure that racism isn't a byproduct of that somehow. Anyway, with that, I'm complete. Thanks, Doug. Um, as, as a tiny sliver example of this, I got to drive in Buenos Aires many years ago. I've only done it once, uh, but if any of you have been to BA, they drive kind of crazy. The and I don't I don't know if it's gotten any better if they've sort of westernized their their manners or Europeanized their manners. But the lines on the road sort of mean nothing, and everybody's floating everywhere, and it looks like chaos. 
And if you're in a cab, you'll notice that your driver's basically minding everything, no, but knows where everybody is. Um, in India, this is resolved by honking, and there's like this insane amount of honking on the street because it's like, I'm on your left quarter in your blind spot, honk, 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 which is crazy making. But in Argentina, it's the closest I've ever come to feeling like I'm part of a flock. And, and if you wanted to just sort of slowly drift across a five lane, and they have some really broad, broad avenues, if you wanted to just sort of drift around whatever, nobody would be bothered. It would be just fine. Put your car right on, on top of the, the striped line. Nobody's bothered. If you make too sharp a turn, the herd is unhappy and you will know it. And it, it's really interesting. And that was sort of cultural competence or whatever on in driving in a city, which is much simpler, I think, than everything else you were just pointing to. But, but I think we underestimate and underrate how those things work. Um, so thank you. Um, Stuart, if you'd like to comment and also check in, that would be awesome. And I'll check in with Michael after you. Sure. So um, a couple of comments. I was I was uh, moved by what what Gil said uh, in two ways. One, the idea that the natural world would disappear, because we all know that when we're we're feeling off, if you just go out in nature, it's amazing how incredibly um, healing and centering um, that is, because it's congruent with the living system. I think that's that's inside of us. But also the notion of Gil saying um, the quote you shared, Gil, about, you know, nation states, nations, you know, <laughs> only get wise when there's no alternative left. But back to Einstein's famous quote that we're never going to solve the problems that we have with the thinking that got us here. The idea of how we've created nation state as an organizational principle for the planet it, it, it's just outworn its usefulness on so many different levels. Um, we are dealing with global challenges when we talk about solutions and nation states um, are focused elsewhere and leaders of nation states are focused el elsewhere. So that is never gonna get us to where we need to be. Um, um, and, and I also, you know, uh, I just agree with the thought that, yeah, we don't have to make the case anymore that it's all collapsing. <laughs> that case has just, it just been, been made so many times, but what is it we're gonna do? Um, you know, it's like a business collapsing and everybody gathers and says, okay, what can we do? We're, we're, heading, we're, heading, we're heading for the collapse, all right? Um, it's a little bit of back to the who moved my cheese uh, book in terms of, you know, um, human, human, human thinking. Um, so those are just some, some, oh, and, and, and yeah, racism is, it's a made up construct. It's just, it's, that's that if you read all the literature and I'm, I'm still digging into some of it because new stuff's coming out. It's just such an, a made up construct. Anyway, um, my check-in very quickly is, um, I'm actually, in process of putting a manuscript together. I've gathered um, like 15 testimonials. My poetry will be out this year. Um, that's a, it'll be a first edition because I'm still doing tweaking, but any writers here know that you're never really done. You know, you can just go on forever, but there comes a time where you just have to, um, to use Seth Godin's work, uh, you know, ship it. <laughs> and it's time to ship it and I'll do a second edition, you know, um, 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 next year, but um, that's my check-in and I'm really pleased to be, be getting that out into the world. I feel some compulsion to actually get it, get it out. So um, thank you, great to be with you all. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Stuart. Um, before Carl, let me go to Michael and see if you'd like to check in. Yeah, um, good to be here. I don't have a whole lot to say. I'm. Uh traveling at the moment and just um, had a chance to at least sit in on the end of this this uh, OGM sesh and um, happy to listen um, the I'm, I'm in the south right now and um, and you know race race is always fascinating to to look at as you you know and people's reactions to race as you change locations and um, 
it's it's just it's just I don't have anything eloquent to say. It's just bizarre, you know. That's such a that's such a construct, such a make believe thing, you know, could could have such effect on the way people behave and congregate and um, and react to one another and how visible it visible the reactions and differences are without even people being conscious of it, I don't think. Um, yeah, that's all, that's all from me. Thanks. Thank you, Michael. Um, Mr. Heavenstrike. Yeah, so uh, there are two kind of two topics uh, with some of the um, real trailblazers I've worked with, they kind of inspired it coined the term paradigm leaps. And I see that as a system of, um, oh, D Doug Engelbart, that might the explanation I came up for how his vision could be both so broad and decades ahead of everyone else's that seeing the converging trajectories of the paradigm shifts that were going on at the time. Uh, and then the a major you know, vibe of that is, um, is Ray Anderson with uh, Interface Carpet. And it was really funny. I found a, the, the crazy thing at GSA, I'm going through getting rid of old equipment. And I found a box and it has a bunch of VHS tapes in it with this interview that the Public Building Service Commissioner um, gave um, or did with uh, Ray Anderson back in 2002. So I, did a search on something called the Internet Archive and found the <laughs> found the um, a digital copy of it. So I I download downloaded it from there and uploaded it to my um, my YouTube channel. But it's really amazing. I got the I've got the visionary like with a statement, and it's like sustainability is not enough. It's in basic we need to get beyond to do no more harm to how can we help the planet heal. And because he did, I mean, um, Kuhn's book, uh, I mean, it came out in 57, he had actually written the Copernican revolution. I mean, and so he, he was possessed by the incommensurability of things. But if you like um, Ray Anderson, he actually, I uh, have it, like he went from conservation to this restorative. So he, um, if we if we think far, and if we get to that next level, then we can be pulling the wall down from the other, <laughs> from the other side. So that's one concept I've been working with. And the other one is with time. And there are two, two major things. We've got the, the group that have been trying to do dominate the whole thing about dominion and we were the we had this heaven garden of eden and everything's been going to hell ever since and as doug talks about it's a self-fulfilling prophecy and then the other side is um rabbi Lerner wrote a book about the left hand of god and john hout who's a jesuit at georgetown um talks about um Basically, God is like a force bringing us into the future kind of thing. So we, we, the future is getting better. And then I've had some conversations with Doug, but it's like that being in the present is that <laughs> is where the tension is and stuff. But then what's the duration of the present? That, that's kind of where where we had uh, we've had a number of conversations there. But I'll leave it with that. But um, and I'll post a link to some of the John Hout stuff. Thanks, Carl. Um, Mr. Truxler, I think you'll have the last word today. Okay, uh, actually a couple of points, Jerry, on, on a couple of things that, that you were talking about. Um, you know, first of all, th this question of, of, do I need to be hit over the head with the doom and gloom message? Uh, you know, that's, not, that's not really the question since the answer to that question differs depending on who you are and what situation you're in and what do you know and what do you not know and and yet we can't I mean there is so much discussion in the climate field of do we need to hit people over the head with doom and gloom or do we not need to hit people over the head with doom and gloom and the answer is yes 
it, it depends on who it is you're talking to. Uh, and, and that's, you know, that's where the whole idea of, of climate chess comes in and, and getting the right information to the right people at the right time, which AI tools should be eminently capable of helping us do today so that we're, we're communicating with people along the lines of, of what they need. Uh, and yet, I'm not aware of anybody doing that effectively today at, at the organizational level. And we just keep debating this question of, do we need doom and gloom or do we not need doom and gloom? It's the wrong question. Uh, second, very quick point is you talk about, I, I was a bit surprised to hear you talk about, maybe you'll set up this website for, you know, if you're not convinced that we're all going to die, what do you do next? Um, and, you know, I've been building that website in a brain for years, and I've spent thousands of hours on that exact question. So, so before you go and build a website, being the brain person that you are, I hope you'll think about, well, what other tools might be available to tackle that question as opposed to a website? Uh, so let, let, me, let me leave it at that. Um, Mark, thank you very much. I wasn't actually thinking of, uh, about resources that already exist. Uh, I, I also think it's funny what you just said because a piece of what you and I and Pete have been talking about a bunch and Harlem from the brain as well is how to make the brain less brain-like and more like a website. Uh, so there's a there's some tiny ironies uh, sprinkled throughout, uh, but I, I will definitely do that then, uh, and point more to your resources because you have been working on that for decades. And thank you. Appreciate that. Um, we are at time. This has been a super interesting call. Uh, I think maybe we'll tweak the process and try something like this, maybe closer to serious conversations in two weeks. And let's think about a topic for next week. Uh, we, we do a poor job of discussing topics before the topic calls. And I don't, I'm not a good shepherd of that conversation. But if, uh, if we want to do that on the OGM Town Square uh, channel on Mattermost, that would be awesome. Um, thank you all. Really appreciate you.